Okay, so now let's start with describing our most basic clustering algorithm, which is called k-means. So to set this up, we have some data, which we'll describe as an n by d matrix. So there are n samples in some d-dimensional space. So in this case here, if the dimension was two, our data points could look like this. Now, what we want to do is try to find clusters of these points. So visually, in this case, this kind of three natural clusters, this purple cluster on the top, and then a green and blue cluster on the bottom. So this is easy to do visually for humans. The question is, can we get a computer to automate this when it's in much higher dimensions? Now, just some notation here. What we mean mathematically is that for each point, we want to assign each point to some cluster, and we'll call that assignment by sigma sub n. So if sigma sub n will be a number from one to k, and we'll indicate which cluster we want to assign that point to. What we mean by having a good cluster is that somehow when two points are in the same cluster, that is sigma n is equal to sigma m, then I want those distance between those points to be small. So that example on the previous slide was just some synthetic toy data, but clustering has many real applications. It's basically, and you can use it anytime you want to segment data or uncover latent categories. So for example, here it could be used, for example, in product classification or in marketing. We might want to group certain types of products together. Now in this particular case, it's an example of what you would call hierarchical clustering. So maybe there would be some category for bicycles, and then within that category, there could be subcategories like racing bicycles or mountain bikes or something like that. I'm not going to show you how to do um, hierarchical clustering in this unit, but go ahead and read about it. There are several packages for doing that kind of clustering as well. Now, there are many applications of clustering in general. For example, here I've shown it in marketing, but it also shows up in genetics, types of financial analysis, and also image segmentation. It's a very widely used technique. Okay. Now that we've sort of understand what understood, what is the clustering problem, let's go ahead and describe a very simple clustering algorithm called k-means. So again, we have our little toy data here in two dimensions. We have five or six points per cluster, and we want to see if we can discover those clusters. Now, the way k-means works really tries to find two key variables. The first is what you would call the mean of each cluster. So there's a fixed number of clusters, k, and we're gonna find k of these means, hence the name of the algorithm, k-means. So in this case, I've shown three means for clusters with these different colored squares, mu1, mu2, and mu3. So if our algorithm worked well, it would find, find cluster centers pretty close to where I have drawn them here. After it's found the cluster centers, it then wants to find the association of the, each data point to, the, uh, to its clusters. And so that's what we were describing before by this assignment variable, sigma n. Now k-means is very easy algorithm for solving these mu's and these sigma's. Basically what you do is you start off with some guess of the cluster centers, mu1 to mu k. Turns out the algorithm's a little sensitive to that, so I'm gonna show you uh, some of the techniques for picking good cluster centers to begin with. After you do this, the first step you do is you update the cluster membership. And that's very easy. All you do is for each of your data points, you assign it to the cluster where it's closest to the center. And I'll give you some examples to make this clear. Once you've got the memberships, then you re-update the means of the cluster by selecting the centroid 
within each cluster. That is the centroid among the points that are selected to the same uh, cluster. And then you just keep on repeating steps one and two until it converges. So that was it in math. Let's take a look in pictures. This comes from Bishop's text, which has a really nice illustration of k-means. So this uh, data actually is on the what's called Old Faithful data set. Old Faithful is a geyser in the U.S. And the variables here, every time that geyser sprays, there's the uh, two variables. One is the duration of time from the last time it erupted and also I think something like the time or force of that eruption. And if we look at the data in these points, so it's a two-dimensional data set, you can see there's kind of two natural clusters, and we want to see if our k-means algorithm can discover them. So the first step in k-means is to pick two uh, potential means. Now, a human would look at this and put them one mean here and another mean here. But let's just say our algorithm started with two somewhat bad selections on this blue point on the left and this red point on the bottom right. The first thing k-means is going to do is it's going to assign each data point to one of these two clusters by picking the points that are closest to the blue and they will get selected to the blue cluster, or the points that are closer to the red mean will get assigned to the red cluster. In this case, the boundary between that is this bisecting line here. So we can see here that all these blue points are selected here, all these red points are selected here. This is a pretty bad initial clustering because it doesn't at all align with what we would intuitively want it to do. But we're going to see it's going to improve quickly over time. The next thing you do is the following. For each of the clusters that you've discovered, you find their centroid. So for these red points here, the centroid is here. And for the blue points here, the centroid is about here. Then you repeat this process. So you assign all the points in, uh, which are closest to the new blue centroid to the blue cluster and all the points which are closest to the red mean to the red cluster. And now you can see we're getting something that's much better clustering of the data. Then you re-update the centroids again and we get into the centers of these uh, clusters and then you keep on repeating the process. And after this ninth step here, we get something that's very close to the way that you would want to visually cluster this. So in this case, it works very well, even though we started with a very bad initial condition. Let's look at some other applications of clustering. One is used in image segmentation, of course, Image segmentation is a very complex um, uh, starting in 1, 2, and 3. Image segmentation, of course, is a very complex algorithm in vision processing, but some types of k-means are used at least in parts of it. But let's look at a very simple way you could segment images by their color. So in this case here, remember that a color image is um, every pixel has an RGB value. So it's a three-dimensional uh, point. And then I could take a look at all the points in that image or all the pixels and then do k-means clustering on these three-dimensional points. So this in this case is the original image. I think this is Bishop's son here. And then when you do the k-means clustering, say with two clusters, I'm going to categorize each pixel to one of two different colors. And that's shown here. So you can see here that the two colors selected are the gold and blue, which are kind of the dominant colors in this image. And it has a kind of natural segmentation of that image into these two colors. So we go to three colors, we get a little bit better resolution of some features. We get to 10, we get even better resolution. 
Now, again, as I said, image segmentation is much more complex, but you could see how this could be part of a building block that could be used in a more realistic segmentation algorithm. Here's a similar one on um, the bottom here with the child in a car seat. This is a very nice illustration of it also in imaging, image processing for detecting types of textures in image, in images. So what happens here is for each pixel, we look at a neighborhood of pixels around it and then get some kinds of statistics of those pixels. And then in those, from those statistics of that neighborhood, we perform k-means. And what you can see here, at least in these images, it can kind of pick up different types of textures. So here we have an image, for example, which was synthetically created by creating one texture on the left and another texture on the right. And when you run k-means, it actually splits those pixels exactly into these two parts. Here we have three textures and again guesses the locations perfectly, gets them with these four uh, um, textures here, and even this circular region one in this case. All right, I just want to wrap up with a couple of mathematical details, and the first of those is on the convergence of k-means. So to understand the convergence of the algorithm, let me introduce something, let's call it the total cluster distance, which is this quantity here. Now what this quantity is, is I sum over the clusters, and then for all the points in that cluster, I measure the distance of that point to the cluster center. So this is kind of the sum of the distances of the points to that cluster center. And that, if that number is small, that means the points are close to their cluster center, and hence close to one another within that cluster. So we want an algorithm somehow that tries to make this total cluster distance small. Now, to understand what k-means does, let's rewrite that total cluster distance this way. This is exactly the same expression. All I have done is I have introduced this variable rni and set it to be 1 when sample n belongs to cluster i and 0 otherwise. And when you do this, this summation here will be exactly the same as this. And this function then is a function you can think of as a function of two variables, r, which is related to selections of which points are in which cluster, and mu, which is the centroids of these clusters. Now what k-means does is you can see that it really alternately decreases j in the following sense. When you do the nearest neighbor step, it's really updating those RNIs in a way to minimize this cost function over R, keeping the mu's constant. And then when you update the mu's in k-means, it's up minimizing this cost function over mu, keeping the R's constant. And so if you keep on repeating this, this cost function is going down and down, and since it's bounded below, it will eventually converge. So it will always converge, but it really only converges for sure to a local minima, meaning, kind of like what we saw in gradient descent, that different initial conditions can result in different final solutions, and some of them could end up with a lower total cluster distance than others. So that brings me to the topic of initial limit. So we saw that the final limit of k-means depends on the initial condition, and some uh, times you end up with a bad clustering with a bad initial condition. So there are some good heuristic algorithms out there one of them is in what's called k-means++, plus plus, which is probably the most commonly used algorithm, and it's one that's also used in sklearn. You can also do things with multiple initial starts. I'm not going to go over them, but feel free to check out this uh, web link. Another um, issue is what you would call distance measures, which is really 
how to measure the similarity between samples. So what we've described up to now is comparing distance with this mean squared distance between two points. But really, you can replace k-means with any distance you want to do. Um, for example, you could select which features you want to do this on. You could try to normalize them, or maybe you want to weight certain features more. You really have a lot of choice, and maybe I'll explore some of these in the homework. So that wraps up our discussion of k-means. What I want you to try to do before going ahead is go into the GitHub. There is an in-class exercise there, and just try to implement this and visualize the implement this by hand and visualize the results on some very simple synthetic data. Um, it's not that hard. It just have to be careful with all the way that you manage the indexing. But I think if you go through that, you'll have a good idea of what's exactly happening in the algorithm. For the lab, you'll just use the canned built-in version in sklearn, which is very efficient. But you'll still, I think, get something out of implementing this manually. So check that out and then go over to the next section.